Men are good. Feminism, toxic masculinity, and gynocentrism. How they work together to ruin men and families. Toxic masculinity is a 21st century version of the 20th century mantra of men are pigs. Same thing, different century. It's a globalization that falsely characterizes a huge demographic, that is, all men, as being bad. The best definition I've ever heard is from Jordan Peterson, who said, Toxic masculinity is an attempt to smear the idea of masculinity by confusing masculine competence with tyranny. One big smear job, that sounds just about right. But why would they want to do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Feminists have built a fictional narrative that has women as victims, as oppressed, as disadvantaged in every possible way, and they needed a fall guy. They needed a bad guy. They needed someone to blame for this made-up nonsense about them being oppressed. What did they do? They created a boogeyman. Who is the boogeyman? Men. You know, the guys who've provided and protected them for eons. Those guys. We'll just sacrifice half the population to get what we want. Toxic masculinity is simply a mammoth and global false accusation. Let that sink in. So they make up these lies about men, and what do they do? They use them as feminist leverage. By the way, using lies and false accusations to get what you want is what scientists are now calling relational aggression. Research is showing that this is more a female thing. So this is in some ways expected, but not tolerated, mind you, but expected. And how does this leverage work? Just think about the Violence Against Women Act. Feminists lied about men being the sole problem of domestic violence and not being victims and used that lie to push legislators to create laws that only helped women. So we now spend a billion dollars a year building a feminist empire that helps women who are victims of domestic violence and ignores the needs of men, even though men are about half the victims. See how it works? Pretty slick, right? The funny thing is that even with all the leveraging of lies and misinformation, which has resulted in so much women firsting affirmative action and gynocentric legislation, women are finding they still can't compete with men in the top echelons. They can fill up middle management, but not the top. Just look at Nobel Prizes, Fields, Medals, Congressmen, CEOs, International Chess Masters, and so many other places. Guess what? Nearly all are men. So what do feminists do? They claim that these bad men are selfishly getting all the really good jobs, and it must be due to discrimination. Rather than admit that they can't compete, it's a much easier gambit to simply say they are facing discrimination from these greedy bad men and, and, and toxic masculinity. For more info on this, you can see my previous video explaining why men are at the top linked in the upper right. So Tucker Carlson, who apparently will be doing shows in March of 2018 on the war on men, had a show where he asked a feminist psychotherapist about toxic masculinity. Tucker asked some very good questions, but she ignored his questions and just went off on her diatribe. Listen to this. Let's talk about what toxic masculinity is and how I understand it. For example, okay. sometimes when I'm on your show, I yep. get death threats, right? Even if it's not a contentious debate, mm -mm. My, I'll get reposted and I'll get, mm -mm. at times, 3,000 men will come out with sort of violent mm. um, words on Facebook or accusations oh towards me that are pretty scary. That's an example of toxic masculinity showing itself, manifesting in our society. Right. Okay, so toxic masculinity is when 3,000 men become violent with you after an appearance on Tucker's show. She goes on a conservative program with ultra-liberal ideas and is surprised at the response and characterizes it as violent. Is it violent, or are people simply disagreeing with her? So let's take a look at some of the responses this woman has garnered online, and you be the judge. It's worth a look just for the entertainment value. Okay. The first commenter says, Please take your head out of your back end, as it is cutting off the oxygen to your brain. I've never heard such ridiculous reasoning in my life. Number two. If you want to remain mentally ill for the rest of your life, see this woman who will maintain that your whiteness is an inherent factor in being a rapist. Number three. 
just experienced your interview on Tucker Carlson's show. With all due respect, I cannot believe the depth of your ignorance and support of such misleading and abusive practices aimed at indoctrinating innocent children. <laughs> Pretty funny stuff, right? But are they violent? No, just disagreeing with her and telling her she is lacking, and she morphs this into toxic masculinity. Yep. My guess is this woman is profoundly exaggerating and claiming victimhood with a 3,000 comment, but let's get to what she said. Okay, so she's saying the reason men are toxic is due to their being violent. Right. But wait. Less than 1% of men are committing violent crimes each year, but this is enough for her to judge the other 99 plus percent? Crazy. Men are good, right? Okay, but when asked whether there was such a thing as toxic femininity, listen to what she says. Is there such a thing as toxic femininity? Can you, you know, be every, too feminine it, or just too masculine? When I was talking to people about doing this question. segment today, people were asking me about that. No, and that's because women don't commit these violent crimes at the rate that men do. So since well, they don't commit much. Okay, so women aren't toxic since they don't commit the crimes at the rate that men do. Hmm. Here's a clue for you, Nellie. Women commit the majority of child murders. They also commit the majority of child abuse. Should we say women are toxic due to this less than 1% of women? Of course not. No one would do such a thing. But when it comes to men being violent, you and lots of other people are very willing to prejudge the 99%. This is what's called prejudice. Crazy stuff. So what else does she say about toxic masculinity? Listen to this. Right. Also, so, another example of toxic masculinity, okay. though, is when we shut down boys from actually having feelings. Okay, we shut down boys from having feelings, and that makes the boys toxic? Seems more like you're saying the people and the culture who are shutting them down are toxic, right? But now we're getting to the basics. Boys should not be violent, that is, they shouldn't disagree with her, and now boys are somehow toxic because she doesn't think they're dealing with their feelings. Here's a clue, Nell. Boys don't process emotions like girls, and men don't process emotions like women. Do men expect women to do things like them? No. They let the women be different. They let them emote in their own way. But do women expect men to be like them? Women like Nell think boys should act just like girls. That's just like them. Isn't that called narcissism? When you expect the world to be like you and flail and gasp when others don't follow your preferred path, Yep, I think so. Ladies, men and boys are different. They don't do it like you do. Can you just love them for who they are? Doesn't seem like it. So women severely judge men as being toxic for very bizarre reasons, and no one blinks. The real question now is why women get away with such prejudiced and hateful judgments. Why could that be? What makes it so easy to judge men and be rewarded? Common sense tells us that most men are not as a group violent. So what makes it so easy to accuse them of this and have it stick? Well, there's this thing called gynocentrism. Nearly all people have large doses of gynocentrism and nearly all of them don't even know they have it. What is it? Well, gynocentrism has been the foundation of how men and women have worked together to build the world. It's basically the assumption that women and children need to be protected and provided for at the expense of men. You know, men die in wars and on dangerous jobs, and they do their best to keep women safe while women take advantage of that safety and have babies. It's like seeing the world through filtered glasses, gynocentric glasses. You know, you don't even notice the sunglasses until you take them off, and the world then looks different. Same thing with gynocentrism except most have never taken their gynocentric glasses off, not without a stiff dose of red pills. This gynocentric filter makes it seem that men should sacrifice for women and women should be provided for and protected. The reality is that we've needed this filter in order for our culture to grow, but at this point we don't need gynocentrism in the same way and are increasingly restrained by it. So having these glasses on makes toxic masculinity look like something that is real and important. Take the glasses off and you see it for what it is, lies and slander. 
This explains a lot of things. Why is it that in public, when men start beating on women, they get an immediate response with both men and women coming to her aid and challenging the offending male? But what happens when it's the female beating on the male in a very similar manner? People look and laugh. Gynocentrism. How about the sentencing disparity, where women get a fraction of the sentence the men get for the exact same crime? Gynocentrism. Or the female genital mutilation is forbidden, but male mutilation is legally practiced a million times a year. Gynocentrism. Or the world's persistent interest in the emotions and problems of women, but turns a blind eye to the emotions and problems of men. Gynocentrism. Or the willingness for an entire culture to judge its men as toxic. Gynocentrism. So when women ask for help, the world listens. When men ask for help, the world laughs, just ignores them, or more likely calls them women haters. How dare they ask for their own needs to be met? Get the picture? And this is why the feminist wails of toxic masculinity get support from both men and women, and why people have such an easy time prejudging men. There's no other group alive that could be prejudged as men are. Everyone would protest loudly with such overt prejudice against any group, but with men, not so much. Yeah, and it's men's fault. So, gynocentrism encourages prejudice towards men while ensuring the safety and provisions of women. Have we ever seen a societally endorsed judgment against a single group like this before? Has our culture ever worn similar glasses? Yep. Think back to the early 20th century. The media, academia, researchers, and the majority of our population worked at propping up the idea that blacks were inferior to whites. I hope you heard that. I'll say it again. The media, academia, researchers, and the majority of the population supported prejudice and racism and promoted the idea that blacks were inferior to whites. The idea was so prevalent that it seemed true just due to its appearing everywhere. Newspapers, magazines, college campuses, billboards, radio, and later on TV. People wore racism glasses and didn't even know it. The researchers would do studies that proved the narrative of blacks' inferiority, and when they found a study that showed blacks were superior to whites, well, they'd just deep-six it, and no one would ever see it. The media went right along and published the party line. The schools did the same. Blacks were defined by researchers and nearly everyone as the perpetrators and creators of social pathology and not as its victims. They were causing all these problems and certainly didn't need help. Academia preached that blacks just needed to be more like whites, and the more time blacks spent with whites, the more they would benefit. Otherwise, they were just inferior. The media played it all up, promoting the message of the inferiority of blacks, even in comedy, with people like the very popular Step and Fetch It, portraying himself as being black, slow, stupid, and lazy. Everyone laughed since it harmonized with the general message of blacks' inferiority. Then in about the mid-20th century, some blacks started stepping up and pointing out the prejudice, hardship, and discrimination that was the hallmark of racism. These brave souls faced attacks for challenging the accepted narrative promoted by the media, academia, and the general population. Very slowly, people started to catch on. The glasses started to come off. Slowly, the filter and spell of racism was unearthed, but not without a great deal of trial and trouble. Ingrained biases die real slow. Now think about today's world. We actually stand in a similar spot. Feminism, empowered by gynocentrism, pushes the idea of toxic masculinity and the inferiority of men. This message is promoted by our schools, our media, and even our researchers. It's so common and prevalent that everyone assumes it's a given. What's the message? Something's wrong with men. They're obviously inferior to women. The media, researchers, and academics all say something similar. Men are the source of our problems. You know, toxic masculinity and all that. If only we had more women running things, the world would be a much better place. Ever heard that before? Think about all the articles you've seen about how women are good and wonderful. Now think of any similar articles about men. Zero. 
Similar to the blacks in the 20th century, it's now men who are defined as the perpetrators and creators of social pathology, and not as its victims. Men are causing all these problems and certainly not in need of help, nor do they deserve it. Men are seen as the cause of problems. Men cause wars. Men's greed ruins the economy and on and on. Therefore, since it's men's fault, they're not considered worthy of help. Just scan your news feed and see how many articles about women in need or in pain and then compare that with the number of articles about males in pain or in need. If you take the glasses off, you can start to see this, but gynocentrism makes it invisible. Gynocentrism makes the suffering of men tolerable. You can see something very similar in today's media, but instead of the bumbling of step and fetch it, you have persistent male bashing and making men look stupid. Male bashing has become a common sport. Media, academia, and the public all participate. Men are portrayed as stupid on TV and people eat it up, not unlike the popularity of Step and Fetch It. Now it's men who are portrayed as buffoons and everyone laughs. They all laugh since this harmonizes with the default assumption that men are inferior. It's just proof of the obvious. Nearly all this goes on invisibly. No one notices. It's the power of gynocentrism. This harness is firmly around the necks of the males in our culture. As with the blacks before, this is now taking a toll on the esteem of our men and boys. Since their sex is held up as the root of our cultural problems, boys grow up thinking that they're inferior to women, that their sex is the cause of our difficulties, that growing up to be a man is something about which he should be ashamed. This is not unlike the message given to blacks that they should be ashamed of their blackness. Of course, one of the first things black activists did was to loudly proclaim, black is beautiful. We can do something similar by proclaiming men are good. We're fighting an uphill battle against a wave of automatons who are easily duped by the gynocentric message of victim women. That has become a mantra of feminists, the media, academia, and our legislators. It is this bias that protects the women when making such bogus claims as seen in their claims of toxic masculinity. The feminists are using the protective flow of gynocentrism to get what they want. And at the same time, they blame men while riding the safety of gynocentrism. Once you take off the gynocentric glasses, you start to see things you've never seen before. Today's Nell Dailies are the present-day Archie Bunkers. Male feminists and TV actors are its step and fetch -its. Our family courts or the domestic violence industry could be likened to the KKK. We're entering a time where men are just starting to stand up and voice the hardship and discrimination they're facing. What is your response to that? Do you defend them or do you attack these men without listening? Wouldn't that be what racists might have done to blacks in the 1950s? What role are you playing? Are you a Rosa Parks or are you a George Wallace? Are you a Dr. King or are you a Strom Thurmond? Do you stand up to this hatred or do you sit back and do nothing. And just to be clear, men are not toxic. Men are good, as are you. And we're beginning to discuss the creation of a men's cyber shed on the uh, Men Are Good Patreon site. So come on and join us. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that stuff. We'll see you.